Nan McKay. Welcome to Trailblazers Impact Podcast with inspiring stories of women who created new paths for other women to follow. Our website is trailblazersimpact.com and you can contact us at hello at trailblazersimpact.com. So your career really did deal with a lot of the mob cases. What, what was your involvement in that? Well, because I was working in the witness security program, mm-hmm. um, it was mostly producing the witnesses. Some of the witnesses that were in prison that cooperated with the government, we would produce them for court testimony. Or some of the witnesses who had been relocated and gotten a new identity and had been debriefed and had to come back to New York to testify in the cases, we would have to produce them for those cases also. So when you say produce them, um, what did that entail? That would entail, if they were regular witnesses and not incarcerated, that would entail housing them, 24 hours security around while they were there, and actually bringing them into the court and sitting next to them while they testified, you know, within reach. So even if they were in prison, wouldn't they be in danger because the mob knew that they were there and... Oh, definitely. Now, just to uh, verify something, when they were in prison, they were in, in the custody of the Bureau of Prisons, and the Bureau of Prisons maintains a separate area where these cooperators are housed so that they're separate from any of the general population for their own security. So we would have to take them out of the prison and we would only be authorized to uh, take them from the prison to court and back to prison. Then they're, they're housed and taken care of by the Bureau of Prisons. But because of their case and because of their um, involvement in the case and their indictment, um, they would be incarcerated during that time period. Did you ever have any problems or hear of anything where the guards might have been bought off and therefore the prisoners were in danger? There have been cases that I was aware of, of not any corruption like that, but there would be incidents where some of these guards may have gotten involved with these prisoners to may provide them with uh, contraband while they were in prison, but nothing of the security matter. So, the, uh, you had an, an Italian heritage, and a lot of the mobsters had an Italian heritage, didn't they? And did that help you at all in doing it, your job? It did. I had a little bit of a little different relationship with, with some of the gangsters I dealt with that were Italian. Um, I could re- relate to some of the uh, cultural issues, and I would have a lot of discussions with them about their own family, and some of them would know that I was Italian, and we would talk about Italy, and we would talk about Sicily, and the most important thing was we would talk about food. <laughs> and I would ask some of them, what would be your last meal? <laughs> And what did they answer you? They would tell me, oh, I, I would like the first thing I would like would be mussels, and then I would like pasta, and then I would like some <laughs> other dish. And then I, So in my years of experience in dealing with some of these characters, I would ask them, write down your favorite recipe. <laughs> and I collected a few of them, and they are in my book, Nondisclosure. What was the most most ruthless person you felt you ever dealt with in that case? Well, some of these gangsters were in jail for murder, and some of them were for multiple murders, and some of them were for 20 and over 20 murders, and some of these murders were dismembered people that they had uh, murdered and you couldn't tell one from the other from speaking to 
a gangster who, who never killed anyone, to someone who did kill someone. But the, the act of murder is so horrific that some of these people, I consider them psych psychopaths. And part of the program is that every one of these individuals, because they've been involved with some real serious crimes, had a lot of psychological issues and a lot of psychological testing before they could come into the program. And the laws have changed over the years where the government no longer can just take somebody from New York and put them in Oshkosh and then while that person is relocated to a new area and commits another crime, then these communities are very upset and they're like, we should have known that this person was living in our area. So the law now is that the government has to notify these communities at a different level that a former criminal convicted person, right? Correctly, is living in your area, but they're not telling them their name or where they came from, but they're being notified that this individual is, is in their area. How does that really help if they don't know who it is? Well, for security reasons, they can't tell them who it is. I mean, yeah, they, I can see why they can't, but what, what advantage does that give them in that area? All it gives them is that um, if a police officer stops one of these individuals and is, say he runs his license plate and it comes out to be Joe Blow, what happens is that when that police officer makes that inquiry on the NCIC, the National Crime mm -hmm. Information Center, he's, it's flagged, the police officer doesn't know it, but it's flagged and so one of us notifies that department and wants to know why the police officer ran a, a plate that is one of these protected witnesses. And then we follow up and find out what the reason is for that. So the police department is going to find out in that situation later on that this individual was contacted with police, with the law enforcement contact. So there are certain things that um, the government is required to do today that they didn't do previously, and which led to a lot of, uh, a lot of issues. So would you say in this case, okay, back off, he's, he, he's ours, or would you no, have to relocate no. the person again, or what would you do? Well. Let me break that down. There's two okay. important questions. Okay, the first thing is we're not going to advise or uh, tell the police department what to do. If this guy breaks the law and they arrest him, we're not going to stop that. However, we will approach the witness and ask him if he wants to be relocated or not. It's because the program is voluntary. And if he feels like his security is going to be compromised, then he can be relocated to another area that the government considers for him to be safe in. But if he denies it, denies to be relocated, sometimes we'll ask him that he'll sign off the program because it depends on a time frame. He could be settled in his new area. He may have children in school. They don't want to make another up, up, upheaval again with their life. And so it's up to the, the witness. But he would have to sign an agreement with us that he's living there in the fact that he could be discovered. So uh, what, uh, what role did cooperating witnesses play against the mob? I mean, were, what kind, they were informants, what of their finances or their operations or why would they be so important that you would need to protect them 
and relocate them? What kinds of testimony? Well, first of all, the government can't make a case on somebody unless it's people actually doing the crimes and knows who else is doing the crimes. So <clears throat> when the investigators dis discover and the, the methods they use to have this person cooperate with them, then um, the, the witness um, has to be willing to come forward and testify truthfully about all previous crimes they've committed and to testify truthfully about his dealings with other people in those crimes. So when they do that, they could be testifying against relatives. They could be testifying against friends, uh, other criminal members. So the government very rarely can make the case because they cannot infiltrate some of these groups unless they have undercover agents to go in there, which is, which is a lot more dangerous than to get somebody to cooperate already on the inside. And a lot of times the cooperators are willing to because either they themselves were lied to or they were double-crossed and they want to get back at, at these other members. And did they fear for their lives if they weren't relocated? There has to be a threat against them. And there are, sometimes there's overt actions. I mean, I'll give you an example. There was an individual shot nine times, lived. He weighed 300 and something pounds and none of the bullets hit a vital organ. Wow. <laughs> he, it was very difficult to get him to cooperate and they almost, they almost killed him. And yet he finally decided to cooperate because they, they were going to kill him, and he, he lived through an assassination attempt. So there are a lot of different scenarios about different reasons why people will cooperate and um, truthfully testify. Because you hear, there's a lot of stories, and one of the most interesting things about this whole program is when these witnesses get on the witness stand, and these defense attorneys try to make them out to be nothing but little rats <laughs> <laughs> and doing it to save their own skin. And in the meantime, they're testifying truthfully against the defendants that are there that, that uh, were more culpable. And taking a big risk to do it. They do, and it's not easy to, especially if you're married and you have a family, and to come onto the program, it's very difficult. It's, I, when I interviewed people for the program, I told them right up front, I didn't paint the rosy picture about this whole process. And they come into the program, they have to cut ties with everyone. They cannot communicate back and forth with former friends, family members. There are some family members that refuse to go into the program with other family members. I mean, they have their own life, and they don't want to upset it and move, and their life's threatened. And some of them have no choice. They have to, because the difference in, with the Sicilian Mafia is that they kill everybody, everybody in the family. So the people that um, come into our program from the Sicilian Mafia, some of them, they don't have anyone left in their family. Most of them all have been killed because they're cooperating. In the United States, in La Costa Nostra, they never do that. They never kill other family members because hmm. somebody cooperates. They don't kill judges. Over in Sicily, they kill judges, politicians. It doesn't matter. Now, in the early 1980s, you said there was a vicious second mafia war uh, in Sicily that claimed over 400 lives. What, what ties were there in Italy, you know, in our communication or our relationship with Italy in prosecuting the mob? Well, in the 80s, there, there was a, uh, an Italian-American working group together because Italy didn't have a, 
witness security program at that time. So just to backtrack a little bit, a lot of the other countries that never had a witness security program studies our program. Mm -hmm. we, we go overseas to a lot of countries and give presentations about our program because it's very difficult for, say, Italy to take somebody from Rome and put them in Naples. It's, it's just too s small of a country, and most European countries are like that. But now the European Union has witness security programs where they'll take somebody from Italy and put them in Germany, or take somebody from France and put them in Spain. But the United States has such a large country, and we're such a diverse population, I always, I always say that the witness security program is an equal opportunity employer. We take people, doesn't matter if you're Chinese, Russian, Italian, Israeli, Colombian, Mexican, that doesn't matter if you're Buddhist, Muslim, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, it doesn't matter. We take so many people into our program and have so many different backgrounds and, and, and uh, languages because we can re relocate people here in the United States because we're so mobile now in this country. It, years ago, you took somebody from New York and you put them out in Oshkosh and because of their accent, they stuck yeah, out like, everybody but, would know. Yeah. <laughs> but today, there are New Yorkers all over. There are people from all different walks of life everywhere. And some people that I know now will say, I know this guy's in a program. He never comes out of his house. He, I said, he's just a quiet person. <laughs> I'm never even so suspicious of people. And yet you have other people that have the welcoming committee for new people to move into the neighborhood. And, and uh, you have a, a, a very diverse group of people. But getting back to the Sicilians, um, they had the war there, and they finally were able to establish a program that we helped them do. And we would take some of the Italians over here to come into our program for their safety, because at, at that time in the 80s, they didn't have someone that could uh, so the Italian government, to make a proposal to someone who wants to be protected for the rest of his life, he wants to know that he's going to be safe somewhere. So <clears throat> they couldn't do that previously, and they couldn't make those cases, and they were killing so many people. Uh, eventually, having some of the Sicilians come here open that all up, and they have, the, they have a new program now that, that operates in their program in Europe. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, your job involved many trips to Italy, yes. it sounds like. Uh, in one trip, you had dinner with somebody named, let's see if I say this right, Manganelli. Yes. Um, tell us who he was and uh, what made that meeting a concern for you. Okay. He, uh, he was the... Um, head of the Sicilian law enforcement in in Sicily, anti-mafia police. So I went over there with a federal prosecutor to interview someone for the program. And when we arrived in Palermo, there was um, agents that picked us up and drove us to the local uh, anti-mafia office. There were guards around the whole building with machine guns. And uh, we went in, we met Manganelli and some of his associates, and we, we had a nice discussion, and we talked about the arrangements that we both agreed upon about this interview of this individual. And so then one of his uh, associates said he would take us to lunch. So we all went out to lunch, but Maganelli didn't come with us. So we did some other business, and, that, and then we went back to our hotel. And later that evening, we got a call that Maganelli would like to have dinner with us. So he was sending a car to pick us up 
and they picked us up and they brought us back to the police headquarters again. So we thought the driver was just going in to get something. He said, no, come, come. So we go in, we get on an elevator, and we go up. It's Maganelli's residence. <laughs> <laughs> Not just meeting you for dinner <laughs> in some restaurant. No, he couldn't leave the building. Ah. So he... Uh, he had a, a wonderful wife and children and dog, and we met everybody in, in the apartment. We had dinner with him. It was it was very nice, and and uh, explained everything about his life and and um, about their problems they're having there and the assistance they would like from us. And so, eventually, um, everything went well with the interview. We had. And we exchanged uh, gifts with Maganelli. And so a few years later, uh, he became the deputy chief of the police in Italy and moved to Rome. And then I heard just a few years ago he passed away uh, from a brain aneurysm. Did you, was, did you ever feel in that visit, for instance, uh, fearful for your life? I did it when uh, a, a different time. I, I wasn't fearful. I, I mean, I knew there were people that were watching their buildings and that there were people um, around there in Palermo that the, the mafia, we were warned that the mafia knows that we're in town and all that stuff. But it wasn't until a couple of years later, a different time when I was in Italy, when I was actually with an Italian, with a Sicilian, uh, witness that we brought back to Sicily to testify. And when they picked us up at the airport um, and we were driving to a different location, I looking out the window, I was thinking to myself of what I would think would be a threat in New York because you, you have different perceptions of what a threat is and who this person is. You know, but being in a foreign country, even though I'm Italian, I, they all had a different appearance than, than you would see people in the United States looking. So when we were driving, um, I noticed there was a female in a fur coat riding on a motor scooter with high heels. And I said, now that's a threat. <laughs> <laughs> in your book, uh, at the time you were talking about paintings, but you made the analogy to the witness protection program, I think. You said, life is divided into light and darkness. And if you're in one, you're not in the other. What did you mean by that? Well, you're either with the good people or you're with the bad <laughs> people. But you know, the paintings were Caravaggio, and he has that chaoscuro, it's the light and dark. And so um, I put it that together a little bit about some of the people I dealt with, some of the good people and some of the bad people. What, uh, you, you mentioned witnesses and the witness protection. What do potential witnesses or other people have to, to do to be accepted into the program? What, what do they have to agree to? Um, what issues do they have to resolve before they're admitted? Things like that. Well, there's an application process. Actually, <clears throat> it's in the manual for the U.S. Attorney's Office who sponsored the individual. So we get an application, and this information is all, it's, this is public information, mm -hmm. I'm telling you. Now. So we get an application from the U.S. Attorney's Office that they want to sponsor this individual. And the information sometimes in that application it's sensitive information because sometimes maybe it's not public. And it's like in the future, this individual is going to testify against A, B, and C. And uh, he's going to, um, he's going to plea against certain crimes that he's already committed. So in the application, there's all kinds of information in there about the witness, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office. So that individual 
usually has a cooperating agreement with the U.S. attorney about his prior convictions, prior crimes, and uh, what he's going to testify truthfully about. So then when we get that information, depending on if this individual is going to be in custody or not, like I mentioned before, sometimes these individuals are in prison. But sometimes the applicant could be getting out of prison. And so that's, that's a separate application they have to make. And then we would have to interview them. And we would get additional information about them and about their family. And all that information is taken and sent to Washington. And in Washington, they make decisions about um, where this person could be relocated to and if this person is acceptable or not for the program. Because there are, um, like if, if, I individual, if I interview an individual and there may be issues with that individual with drugs or psychological issues, uh, our recommendation may be that this person isn't um, acceptable for the program. And the U.S. Attorney's Office, in that application that they make, would say that the program is the last resort. They've exhausted all other means of helping this individual, keeping them safe, because they could give this person some money and just say, get lost. You know, but you're not going to get new identity. You're not going to get a relocation. You're not going to go into the program. If that's not possible, because some of these cases, these drug cases, like in New York, you could take somebody from the Queen, Queens and put them in Brooklyn in these neighborhoods, and they, they may be fine. It all depends on who they're going to be testifying against and the organization and, and what the capabilities are of reaching this person. Well, you referred to the acting boss of the Luchis crime family when his son had issues that had to be resolved before they could go into the program, what kinds of things would that be? Do you remember that case or what Yes, there were, there were drug issues. Okay. So we wouldn't take, so that at that time and in any other case, um, the investigative agency that's sponsoring that individual, they would have to take care of that person and do whatever they do before that person could be uh, eligible to come into the program. So some of the family might be admitted Correct. and protected and relocated. Yes. But some of them, even though they might want to, would have to have some of those other issues resolved before they could actually be, go with the rest of the family or or be admitted somewhat right. to go somewhere else. Right. Okay. Why, why is it difficult for relocated witnesses to settle into a new life? Well, there's a lot of different reasons. Um, basically, the um, program is to take an individual living in a danger area, give them a new identity, put them in an area they're safe, and become self-sufficient. Some of these people have never had employment before. Some of these people who worked in these organizations, criminal organizations. They didn't have an eight to four job. You know, they didn't, they didn't know what uh, regular work was. So for them to go to some area and have to start all over again, it's difficult financially, it's difficult for the uh, mentality and it's difficult to get established and create a change. So the successful cases are the people that have an epiphany that can make the change to be able to start a new life again because it's, it's a second chance. Some of them can't make that change. Some of them just get to the program, get out there and start all over again committing crimes. And I talk about people that uh, couldn't make that change and that um, they failed to be able to take advantage of that opportunity of a second chance. So 
the program, like my position in the program is totally different from my coworkers in the program in these relocation areas because they're more like social workers. They have to get this new family coming in in this new area and help them become self-sufficient to get the kids in school, medical issues taken care of, all of those issues that these relocation inspectors take care of. But they're not babysitting for these, these uh, new witnesses in their area, but they're there for their assistance. So there's a lot of issues, and everybody, as you probably know, everybody has different issues about different things. And one of, the, one of the issues that I mentioned in the book is about a family relocated to a new area, and their son is a high school football star. <laughs> so they're gonna so be spotlighted. The newspaper wants to, where'd this kid come from? So sometimes you can't get involved in things you were doing before because it brings too much attention to you. And the program is for not to bring attention to you, as you know. So it's interesting, and it's, uh, every case is different. What happens with those people who are not successfully successful in their relocation? In other words, they were relocated, but they fail. They fail. They get terminated from the program. Um, some of them end up back in jail. Some of them commit suicide. Uh, there's just so many different um, scenarios, so many different um, cases oh, that, yeah, yeah. Do witnesses have a fear of testifying? They most certainly do. Some of them that haven't testified before, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult not only to testify, but to testify truthfully so that these prosecutors that have been briefing them about what their testimony is going to be about. Um, there are times where these witnesses would say to us about testifying, like, I can't do it, I can't do it. I write about one who was suicidal and, and uh, they show up in court, they know so-and-so is going to be there, and these are friends, relatives. I mean, there have so been have people... Look them in the eye. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe so, even be so almost close enough to touch, you know? Uh, yes uh, or no? Just, yeah, well, not that close, but <laughs> but to look them in the eye and to hear them, and, and um, there's a lot of... There's a lot going on, with, and, and sometimes um, you have to know all the backstories to all these different individuals because they're criminals to begin with. The majority of them are. I mean, we've had, we've had people come into the program that weren't criminals, that we've had nuns, from nuns to mass murderers to, you know, just regular people that had information. But... Um, it's not easy for some of these people to testify. So is there drama in the courtroom sometimes in these cases? Oh yes, definitely. Drama and a lot of shouting. <laughs> <laughs> a like lot of screaming. Like the person who is being accused saying... Well, you know, it's, a lot, it's a lot of between the defense attorney and the witness because the defense attorney wants to impress the jury that this person on the stand is, is lying and that he's trying to save his own skin and making up stories about the defendants that he's testifying against. So the exchange back and forth is between the defense attorney and the witness on the stand. And if, depending on the judge who lets whatever come in to, for the record, uh, controls that. So do you ever have people that have lied and what happens oh, when okay. they try to go into the program, and how do you find out? And what if you don't find out till after they're in the program? What about all that? Well, the ones that lie, that's between them and the U.S. attorney or prosecutor, because that's that agreement I was talking about earlier. They have to agree to tell the truth. And so if they rip up that cooperation agreement, then that guy's going back in jail. Mm. So... 
Tell us what you know about the John Gotti trial. That isn't too long ago. When was that? Well, there were three, I think there were three different trials with Gotti. Because uh, all the different jurisdictions in New York went after him. It was the DA in Manhattan and um, the Brooklyn case with the Eastern District. And um, I think that Manhattan, they tried him twice and he got off. And then Brooklyn in federal court, they finally prosecuted him. But I didn't have much to do with, um, with the Brooklyn case on that, that trial there. Some other people in my office handled that. And he was eventually Yes, he was convicted. eventually convicted and, and uh, he passed away in prison. So what was the Colombo War? The Colombo War was these two different factions of the Colombo family. They were fighting back and forth from, uh, from the late 80s to early 90s. And they were killing a lot of uh, members of each faction. So when so, you say the family, you mean like a, a father over here and an uncle over here? No, the, fam the crime family. So the crime family, the Colombo crime family with their members, they had a split. It was like, I think it was the Persico faction was fighting another faction of the uh, crime family. And that's what, um, that's what that war was about. You said the role of Gordon Gecko in the movie <laughs> Wall Street was based on Boski. Who was Boski? Ivan Boski was a um, Wall Street swindler, you would say, because <laughs> he ended up in jail. And uh, at that time, he was, uh, it was a big news item about him. And uh, there was another incident there where our division was called on to provide protection for him to move him around during that time period because he was such a uh, celebrity, you would say, in the criminal world at that time. Him and also um, Michael Milken. He was another Wall Street guy that um, the Southern District of New York prosecuted, and we provided um, some protection for him also. So did it ever bother you that you were providing protection for people that were the bad guys? No. Um, we knew that there was a reason the bad guys are being protected, because they were um, providing information for the government to get the bad guys. So it was the good guys yeah. that were trying to get the bad guys, so you had to <laughs> bad guys so the good guys could get them. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What was your involvement with the Al-Qaeda case? Okay. Um, back in 1996, I went to interview an applicant that the U.S. Attorney's Office made for a um, individual. And this individual was one of the original members of Al Qaeda, and he was uh, given money by Bin Laden to purchase training camps and equipment, and he was like the payroll guy for um, Al Qaeda. But he ripped off Bin Laden for a hundred grand and split the Middle East and went to Europe, and then he. He realized that they were after him, and he walked into an American embassy and told them who he was, and he wanted to cooperate with the government. So probably a few months after that, after he was debriefed by different by the CIA and FBI, and, and he came into America, they made an application for him to come into the program. Um, it wasn't known at that time that he was a cooperator, that he was even in the United States. So he came into our program. I interviewed him and his family at that time. So then um, when I interviewed his wife, 
there was an interpreter there, and she didn't want to have anything to do with the program. She felt that bin Laden was putting a hex on the family if, if they cooperated with the Americans. So I explained to everybody at the table, even the prosecutor and them, that the program is voluntary. If she wants to go back to their country, uh, she can go. But if they get relocated and she goes back, we have to move him because he can't be, because she wouldn't know where he's at. So um, she stayed with him and they had a baby in the relocation area and the baby had a major medical issue. And so she was convinced that Bin Laden put a hex on them and affected their baby. Oh. Oh. So it caused a big stir between him and his wife and, and um, they still stayed together. And that's a, a, another case where, you know, you have individuals in the program that disagree on things and if, if families separate and they one knows where the other's at um, we have to You've take measures risk. Yeah. right so that's like like talking about before um, we'll tell that person if you want to leave we'll relocate you but if you don't you have to sign that we're not responsible because you know you decided to stay in a relocation area and and your ex-wife knows where you are. So they stayed together, I think, because um, it came around 2000, one, 2000, right around 2000, the year there was going to be a big, um, the 2000 celebration was coming about. So in the meantime, Right prior to that, there was the bombings in uh, Africa where the American embassies were bombed. So they needed more access to this Al-Qaeda individual. So the agents and the prosecutors that work in that case talked to us about getting quicker access to this guy. So we made arrangements for a secure video, uh, a kind video of a connection, connection. Yeah. right? So that was very unusual to do that, so we wouldn't have to be moving them around and stuff. Do they do more of that now, where you can just do it by video? They sometimes they do because I've done that previously with the Sicilian. Instead of bringing them back to trial in Sicily. Uh, we did a few video conferences in neutral areas where we had a secure contact with, by vi video, video to the courthouse, and they testified that way. So right now, it's almost a luxury being with them? Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, <laughs> for, to let my grandson know the life of uh, not only what I did, but also uh, a little bit about his heritage and what he, he could uh, find out about, because I didn't know my grandfather that well. He passed away when I was in the service. And so that's, that's the whole reason why I wrote the book. Yeah. Did that terrible car accident that you were in, did that have an effect on your life and how you felt about mm. life in general and your yeah I, I write in the book there and, and all of the uh, pieces with that you know with family etc. I write in the book there that um, I don't I don't wear a watch anymore. <laughs> and why is that? Because time doesn't doesn't bother me. It doesn't. Uh, it's not important. It's just. Just being somewhere is good. Yeah. And do the ghosts in your head dance on and on? <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah. Thank you for sharing with us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed listening to another story of the impact of trailblazers. 
visit our website at trailblazersimpact.com and connect with us at hello at trailblazersimpact.com. And remember, you must learn a new way to think before you can master a new way to be. Thank you.